Good afternoon, everybody. We're starting uh, the second Collegium Talks of this spring, and our title is Curiosity Driven Research in Practice. Uh, I'm Carolina Snell. I'm a sociologist interested in science and technology studies. I come from uh, Helsinki Collegium of Advanced Studies, which is uh, the one uh, hosting this session. And so do all these three wonderful researchers. They also come from Helsinki Collegium. Um, and we are going to talk about curiosity-driven research. Uh, they will introduce themselves a bit more later, but we have Pat Patricia Garcia, uh, Alexander Nikolaev, or Santeri. And then, unfortunately, we don't have Elina Hartikainen, who had to cancel, but we have as interesting uh, and important researcher as well, Silva Nurmia. So they will be sp speaking uh, and telling about themselves. Um, but first, a couple of words about um, Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies. Uh, it's an independent institution in the University of Helsinki, located just a uh, sort of a strong throw away from here at Fabian in Katsu. Uh, and it's an institution for researchers in humanities and social sciences. And uh, it's somewhere where we can actually do research, collaborate with researchers, have a research community. Uh, and it's a sort of a place that facilitates interdisciplinary research, but it also facilitates curiosity-driven research. But what is curiosity-driven research? This is something we want to talk about here. Um, is it just a buzzword? Is it something else? Uh, is it uh, related to, to basic science? Or is it something we, social scientists and people of humanities, use as a word to avoid talking about um, relevance or utility of research, for example? Well, anyway, I'm not going to talk anymore. I'm going to give the floor to these three outstanding researchers from the Helsinki College of Advanced Studies, and they're going to tell their experiences and understandings of what is curiosity-driven research. And first, we have Patricia. Thank you, Carolina. Um, so I'm Patricia Garcia. I'm Associate Professor at the University of Nottingham in Comparative Literature. And here at the Collegium, I'm URIAS Fellow. And for those of you who are not familiar with the URIAS scheme, it's a co-funded scheme between the Collegium and the uh, European Research Council. So as a researcher, I'm particularly interested in the application of concepts of space and place to the literary text, and also uh, on what the literary text can tell us about our own human spa spatiality, which we can summarize as um, being in the world and understanding ourselves in relation to the spaces that we inhabit and the ones that we cannot or we're not allowed to inhabit too. So I'm going to just tell very briefly how I got interested in this type of approach to the literary text, which basically is summarized as that every time I'm reading a literary text, I'm focusing on spaces. That's all I see, that's all I prioritize. I'm focusing on the type of spaces, how, I, how they are described, how they describe the characters, how they construct the plot, and also the type of political and gender symbolisms that they might have. So I'm completely obsessed by that. And that's called geocriticism, if you want a buzzword, or if you're not familiar with that type of approach or methodology. So I'm going to tell uh, three very brief stories on how I got interested in this type of approach. First of all, I've always been fascinated, and actually what you see there is one of my slides. It's not uh, created here by uh, Dr. Kulma, it's one of my slides. I've always been fascinated by the sense of relief that we experience when on a map we see this dot saying, you are here. Especially when we are lost in a new city, but also when we are lost in a space that should be familiar to us. And in a way, that sense of relief and that necessity to be constantly reminded where we are and reassured expresses our, we could say, cartographic anxiety, this constant need to be reminded that we are in space. So that's the very uh, general philosophical background that I'm interested in. The next one 
is a more specific anecdote, and it was many years ago. I attended a theater performance in Buenos Aires by a company called Teatro Ciego, in Spanish meaning blind theater. And it's a theater company created by visually impaired people. And what they do, they create a, a performance simulating a condition of blindness, meaning that you get into it together with the other, um, with the audience. You don't know where you're going, it's completely dark. You don't know how many people are present there, you don't know how many actors, you don't know where the stage are. It's a, it's a simulated experience of blindness. And then the performance starts, obviously you can't see anything, so you are forced to reconstruct what they're telling you by um, stimulating the other senses. So they play music, they also, um, stimulate your touch, they, they threw some water, etc. Well, not loads of water, just a little bit of it. <laughs> um, so I realized that by being deprived of sight, I was reconstructing the plot by paying attention to the spatial associations that they were describing. For example, to where the characters were being located, to where I was being located to the stage. I was starting to reproduce these, um, these spatial relations in my mind the spatial mechanisms. So I realized that without the support of sight, and if we transpose this to a reading context, without the support of the written page, what was happening in my mind is that I was be building a mental world of spatial relations. So I started to be very interested in how to approach the literary text, not as a temporal object, meaning plot, of um, scenes that take place in time, but as a spatial object, meaning as a set of, uh, of relations, as I'm saying, that take place in space, and storytelling as a form of a, a guided tour, as if I was being guided through a map, as a map-making ma activity. And the final anecdote that I'm going to tell, or oh, before I go to my actual project, I was sitting in a cafe, and I was finishing my PhD a while ago, and I overheard this conversation from this lady who wanted to escape the Irish weather because we had had a very long uh, winter, and she wanted to go to a sunnier place. And the, the, her friend said, oh, I'm reading this novel set in a small town in the east coast of the US, and the, character, the protagonist says, it's a great place, you should go there. And it just came to my mind how, well, first of all, the great work that the author did to enhance this effect of realism, but also how as readers, the, the factual and the fictional are totally intertwined in the expectations we have about spaces. And we know this very well when we attend, when we are traveling and we're visiting a city for the first time, if we have read about that city, how those texts influence what we are expected to see. So having this in mind, and being very curious about the spatial and the text, how I put that into practice in my first book called The, um, the Architectural Void, published in 2015, I was interested in not determining, because that has been done a lot by narratologists, how the space can create the effect of realism, the effect of a real world, by, for example, referring to cities that we all know, but how space creates impossible spaces, so how space creates the effect of the impossible, how impossible spaces can be created through words. I worked on four categories, body, boundary, hierarchy, and world, and to create those, to theorize about this, I had to transcend narratology, certainly, and to draw from other disciplines, so, such as uh, socio-urban studies, anthropology, and philosophy of space. And just finally, I moved away from that when I completed that project, and I moved to a more specific um, concept of space, which is the city, and this is my current project. And I'm looking at the um, overlaps between the European city in the 19th century, between urbanist developments in major capitals, and how these developments have been expressed in literature of the fantastic. If you think about 19th century cities and the literature is about that, you might think about the realist novel. But I was interested in approaching the sort of expressions of metropolitan modernity through the fictions of the fantastic. And I'll leave it here. This is an overview of how my curiosity has shaped my research and how I have managed, or I'm trying to manage, to turn this curiosity into um, scholarly, scholarly production. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. And then, Santeri. Thank you. 
So uh, my name is Alexander Nikolaev. I'm a core fellow at the Helsinki University Collegium for Advanced Studies as Patricia and as Silva. So and uh, uh, so far I have studied how processing of language is modulated by either age or the DC. So I'm comparing uh, younger adults to other uh, older adults and also to patients with mild cognitive impairment or uh, Alzheimer's disease. So I have started as, um, uh, so I, uh, I've got my PhD at the University of Joensu, or nowadays it is University of Eastern Finland at Joensu. So I took this picture from, I guess, I, if I remember correctly, the name of the lake is, is Pyhä Selkä. Uh, so it's, uh, and uh, my, I started as a student in Joensu and uh, my master thesis were about uh, complexity of different inflectional types. And uh, if you are wondering what is an inflectional type, then uh, I will, I will tell you, uh, for example, if a novel word is coming to uh, your language, let's say it, uh, your native language is English, <clears throat> and there are some novel words coming, then what are those chances that the, the novel word will follow some certain inflectional type, like, for example, table tables? So if you have to inflect this novel word, what are those chances that you will inflect it according to table tables type uh, or for example some other type like for example uh, child children so for child children uh, those chances are relatively low or actually almost zero because it's it's closed it's frozen in language and let's say if there are some novel words like novel proper names let's say a, uh, a surname Putin. So if I say how many Putins are there, I am, I am inflecting this Putin according to the most productive type. So I have studied these uh, different inflectional types, but not in English, in Finnish, because Finnish is way uh, more interesting and way more complex morphologically than, than English. Uh, for example, according to uh, the basic dictionary of Finnish, uh, we have as many as 49 different types, inflectional types, and only for nouns. Uh, so um, I have studied what are those uh, cognitive mechanisms behind our decisions, how to inflect some words that are new to us uh, in, in, in your particular language. In this case, it was Finnish. So it was my study in Jöns, but then, uh, then uh, um, uh, a professor, my professor, my supervisor, Yusiniemi, uh, started collaboration with uh, the Kuopio University Hospital and with the Department of Neurology, and we started a new project, and that's that is how I. Uh, started to uh, study patients with uh, mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease. Um, so we uh, asked them to perform some uh, tasks, like for example, to uh, inflect uh, words in the mother tongue, and uh, we also have measured the um, uh, brain waves uh, by using uh, the technique called EEG, electroencephalography. Uh, and later on, we also put them into the big machines, big scans. Uh, we call them MRI, magnetic resonance imaging scans machines. And we have obtained those brain images. Uh, because of the copyright issue, I put uh, a real image of, uh, of uh, one guy. Uh, and the guy is actually me. So only because I, I, I own my copyright uh, 
to, to my body, uh, I, I, I decided to put my, my brains there. Those are actually actual pictures of my brains. And, uh, but, but actually, it's, it's, if, if I, uh, so I told you those are actual pictures, but I, I, I am lying. Those are not pictures, those are uh, models. So whenever you see in articles, in newspapers, um, magazines, wherever, whenever you see some brain pictures, those are, those are not pictures. Those are models obtained or constructed um, by a computer from the signal received from those MRI machines. So, and um, uh, that's how the, this neuro, neuro-linguistic perspective uh, came to my life, and I'm happy to continue this kind of research. And also, uh, I, all, almost all of my uh, collaborators, colleagues, are either in Finland or in the US. So I'm happy to have uh, um, colleagues of mine working on the same subject with me. And since, again, because of the copyright issues, I had to choose some photo of New York. I chose one from my phone. This is an. This is a metro station, uh, actual metro station uh, I took with my uh, iPhone. So, and um, this uh, kind of collaboration was really fruitful. And uh, all my recent uh, publications are made in collaborations with uh, my uh, colleagues from New York, although they are living now in different cities in the US. But, but we all are coming from the same uh, they are coming from the uh, Neuro Linguistic Laboratory at the City University of New York. And uh, my uh, advisor there was Professor Lauren Obler. So I'm really, really happy to have her as my advisor. So, and that's about this slide. And uh, so I think it's pretty much all about this short introduction. Okay, thank you. Now, Silva, and then again, Silva Normia, who uh, is substituting very well, I hope. <laughs> uh, Elina, who couldn't come for those who came later, but this is even, I would say, even more interesting. Uh, thank you. Hi, so I'm Silva Normia. I'm um, also a core fellow at the Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies, like Alexander. And like Alexander, I'm also a linguist, but specializing on somewhat different things and with quite a different research path. So by training, I'm a Celticist. So I worked on the Celtic languages, which are shown on the map here. So these are languages spoken in um, the UK, Ireland, and also in Brittany in, in France. And I work particularly on Welsh, uh, the language spoken in Wales, so the red bit on this map. And um, quite early on, I wanted to specialize on medieval Welsh. So I worked with texts from, for example, from manuscripts such as this. Um, this is the Book of Aneirin, it's a 13th century manuscript containing a really long poem about um, a group of warriors who all get killed in this particular battle. It's a really good poem. And how I got into this is purely by curiosity, really. So as a teenager, I was fascinated by old languages and literatures, and especially those of medieval Britain. And when I was 18, I just decided to move to Wales. Um, so I could study Celtic languages, and I spent six years in Aberystwyth, here in a picture. <laughs> I tried to find a sunny picture, but I couldn't. And honestly, <laughs> this is like a realistic picture of what the weather is often like in West Wales. Um, I did my bachelor's degree and a research master's degree there. And then for my PhD, I moved to Cambridge in England, where I could find a sunny picture pretty easily. And I did my PhD on grammatical number in Welsh from a mostly historical perspective. So I wanted to understand, for example, why there are so many ways of forming plurals in medieval Welsh. So this is a little bit why, like what Alexander was talking about with table and tables. So the way that we inflect nouns to show different things, such as number. So I was interested why in the, the reconstructed Celtic proto-language, there's a, not that big a number of forming plurals, so table, tables. But in medieval Welsh, there's, depending how you count, about 20 ways of forming the plural, which is very different from, say, modern English or modern Finnish as well. 
So I was curious to know why that is, and I've wrote a whole PhD on it. And then I went to Dublin for my first postdoc for three years, and then I came here to Helsinki for my second postdoc. And part of the reason for coming here was because my research is now going in a somewhat new direction. Namely, I'm broadening my research into general linguistics and into linguistic typology, which is a field of linguistics that studies patterns that occur widely in the world's languages, regardless of whether those languages are related. So we're interested in patterns that occur wild, widely in languages or possibly in all the languages, so kind of universal patterns. And we want to understand why these patterns are so crucial to human language. And my project here at the Helsinki Collegium is on a formation called the Singulative, which I will very briefly explain. So it's a form that nouns take in some languages, not in English, so I can't really explain it through English. But it's a form where the short basic form of the noun that doesn't have anything added to it means many things, and then you have to add something to it to mean one thing. So if you think about table, tables in English, this is the total opposite of it. So the basic form would mean many things, and you have to add something like an ending or something to mean one. Um, and the way I'm doing this is I'm making a database of this phenomenon in all the languages that I can possibly find it in, hopefully quite a comprehensive one, and then I'm going to start analyzing that data and asking questions such as, why do certain languages do number this way and not in the way that, for example, English does it with table tables? And in the future, I'm actually hoping to broaden that, for example, to include cognitive and neurolinguistics. So I'm asking Alexander questions very often about, you know, has anyone done any work on how these kinds of constructions are represented in the brain? So the Collegium is, is a very good place for this project because of, of colleagues who have expertise in these kinds of things that I don't have expertise in. Um, and the reason I wanted to do this project is because Welsh, so the language I did my PhD in, um, has this construction, and I was very curious why we don't find it in most languages in Europe, and I wanted to then kind of fill this gap in our knowledge of this particular noun construction. So I only had about two hours to think about what I was going to say, because I was asked to come and replace Elena in this talk. But really, quite quickly, when I was thinking about what to say, I realized that my entire research path so far has been pretty much completely curiosity-driven, and it's taken me in fields that I wasn't necessarily expecting to end up in when I was 18 and moved to Wales, and it's taken me to a number of different countries as well. So that's been great. That's all I want to say. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> so Silva says that curiosity has more or less less led her throughout the sort of a, her research path. So what is like, what else is curiosity? Or what, does curiosity play an important role? Or what is curiosity-driven research? If you start thinking about what you do, what is the role of curiosity in your research? Well, I could, yeah, I could continue on that. So I think in my own research, it's always been about kind of finding a gap in my own knowledge about something and wanting to find out more about it and then actually going to the literature or asking other people and realizing that no one else has done it either or they've only done a little bit of it or, or not enough for me to really understand mm. something. So I would say that in my kind of field of humanities, curiosity really is the, the starting point and then realizing that there's some sort of a gap that you can address in your research. Mm -hmm. Well, before this uh, session, I actually ask Siri from my MacBook computer. So I ask, uh, what does curiosity mean? And Siri answered that uh, it is a strong desire to know or learn something. So that's probably, so she, she might be right. So, but then I ask, uh, not Siri, by myself, what something? And uh, I answered to myself that probably something important. And then I continued this chain by asking uh, why it is important and uh, uh, for whom. And I think that uh, whenever you are studying something, and even if your research is curiosity driven, you are forced, at, some, at least at some point, uh, probably in the very beginning, to answer those kind of questions. And, and I think in, 
in every research, those answers might be different. So mm -hmm. there are no silver bullet uh, for, for, for uh, the, that kind of questions or issues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in my case, well, as I said, I think curiosity is very much, for me, is very much interrelated with inspiration, with mm -hmm. finding something that inspires you to pursue it further. But not only that, um, I think it's the capability of researchers to see something I, and identify th that there's a question behind it, that that really is leading you to a question. To have the willingness and the tools to address it, because maybe not everyone has that opportunity and background. And for me too, is this ability to sit with this uncomfortable feeling of this restless feeling that there's something you don't know that you will need to pursue it, and it's very likely that you won't find the answer you're expecting or you want to find. And it's an uncomfortable feeling that researchers tend to have, but it's really uh, the productive engine of, of my mm. work, personally. Mm. So curiosity is something you have to have to start finding good research questions and topics. Does curiosity show somewhere or somehow in your like, everyday work or what you do in practice? Or is it just like hard work? Or is curiosity somewhere there in your daily practices too? Yeah. I'd say it's there in my daily practice. Certainly I can't figure out how to pursue any long-term project or any substantial piece of scholarship without having this engine driving it. I would find it very hard to mm -hmm. get out of bed, but I think those of us who have um, the funding and the space, for example, provided by the Collegium to do it, are privileged to have the time and space to be able to carry out projects mm -hmm. that develop organically based on, on how curiosity is leading us. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, I'd agree. It is kind of the leading light in your research. So it might not be there every single day. Like I think you do have days that are just tedious or you're doing something... Um, you know, that's not inspiring the entire time, or there are days that you just have to do admin. But it is the thing that I think you need to remind yourself of, of several times a week, definitely, when you're doing a research. Like, this is the reason that we are doing this, and I have this habit of, of really putting my research questions, like, up on post-it notes so that I remember what this is, mm. this is all about, because otherwise, there's no point, really. <laughs> you don't do this for fame or money, so, mm. yeah. Yes, I also agree with Silva and Patricia that uh, you can easily find yourself doing research or working for a wrong reason. For example, some of us might pursue a career and following some paths that are rather easier to go, uh, and by, by or by I don't know studying studying some dogma is actually easier. It's easier to publish mm -hmm. any research that fits to some existing dogma than uh, any research that is slightly outside or mm -hmm. in opposition to the dogma. And, and, so, and I think that uh, the, the, the only uh, right reason is to do research only if you really, really like it and it is really, really your thing. I mean, go for it if, if it turns you on then go for it. If it, if, it don't, if it doesn't, then there is no sense to do that mm -hmm. because it, there, there will be so much obstacles that, that you, at some point you will give up. Mm. So there's curiosity, trying to find good research topics and something, but when do you actually know that the idea that you've had is worth pursuing? Or is it just that you pursue it and then... Do you know, do you, is this a sort of a question you uh, sort of have to deal with in your work? Like, does curiosity lead to always something good or, or when do you know this is something interesting? May I continue yeah. since? <laughs> and, uh, so, or may I rather reformulate your questions about the ideas and so where, where they are coming from. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think that, for example, in my case, some ideas are actually coming from people you work with. And I don't 
in, by, by those people, I don't mean uh, colleagues, but I rather mean your research subjects. So I mean, uh, for example, if you work with some patients, then uh, many ideas are coming uh, from, uh, I mean, observing or, or noticing something which is important from, from their perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, and for example, and also, uh, it depends also on your patients and the uh, patients available to you. For example, it just happened that uh, the Department of Neurology, uh, I work and I am still working with at the University of, uh, at the Coopia University Hospital, they have those patients with Alzheimer's disease and with other types of dementia. Uh, and but now I am trying to uh, collaborate with a different department and a different hospital, mm -hmm. and they don't have dementia patients, but they do have. Uh, patients suffering from aphasia. So uh, I can't uh, go there with my research questions because aphasia is a different type, different syndrome, different language problems. Uh, and so you have to tailor your research questions, your hypothesis towards your uh, patients you work yeah. with. Uh, or maybe I'm not supposed to say patients, um, but it, more polite way to say individuals with aphasia or individuals with Alzheimer's. So, and sometimes it's only by chance. I mean, for example, I was uh, studying uh, performance, language uh, performance in, in individuals with uh, Alzheimer's disease here in Finland. And uh, because there is no database, no available or no existing databases of Finnish language, I had to calculate some, link, uh, some uh, uh, lexical characteristics of words by myself from different corpora. Mm -hmm. And because I had to do that, one of, one of those var variables I was calculating was so-called morphological family size. Uh, I, I, I calculated how many compounds, what, what is a compound? For example, uh, child is a not compound, but, but Child care is a compound. So I had to calculate how many compounds each word has, and I did that by a, a semi-automatic process. I, I, I wrote some code, uh, and I, I got uh, thousands and thousands of compounds. Not all of them were semantically related to my target words, so I had to trim the list and I had to drop many compounds that are not semantically related, only orthographically. So they share uh, strings of letters. Uh, so they are related to the target word only by chance. So I dropped all of them because I was interested in the semantic component, mm -hmm. how they influence, uh, for example, word recognition. But then later on, I, I, I thought, OK, I have actually two variables. One is semantic and one is purely orthographical. So the orthographical one is, is a large, is, is way larger than the semantic one. But why, sh why should I drop it? Maybe I can also put this one into the model. And what I found was that uh, young adults, young Finnish adults are uh, sensitive to the semantic component and the semantic component is actually driving word recognition uh, significantly, and but uh, older speakers uh, are more sensitive to purely orthographic overlap. So the whole study was uh, done by an accident that because I was dropping all the time something, but then I decided why I'm doing that. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should also put this in the model as a different uh, explanatory variable. So that, that some, some, and I think not some, but many studies are done only by chance. Chance, curiosity, and lots of hard work. Right, yeah, right. Yeah. Patricia, you had something to... Yeah, well, in my case, sorry, the question was whether it always leads to something, or yeah. when does it happen, or when yeah. do you know it's happening, right? In my case, I'm thinking as a comparatist in comparative literature, it's whether when I see a pattern in texts or an exception to a pattern. And that's, where I, that's when I identify there's something going on and it needs to be further scrutinized. Mm -hmm. 
Now, whether it always leads to where I would like it to lead or where I would expect it to lead, I don't know. I need to start. Then at that point, I'm interested in it, I'm curious about it, and then I start reading about it. Uh, other people have approached it from different angles, that you do your literature review, and that's when you realize maybe that this is only going to get, like, lead you to a journal article, perhaps, or that there's space for a larger collaborative uh, project that needs the input from other disciplines. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example from an observation. So, as Alexander, a lot of uh, the projects that I'm developing start from an observation that triggered by some exception to the rule or some pattern, as I, say, as I was saying. I um, was reading one of the most influential anthologies of fantastic literature um, produced by Borges, Bioy Casares, and Silvina Ocampo in the mid-20th century. It's called Antología de Literatura Fantástica. And they compiled a lot of uh, works from different cultures all over the world, translated them into Spanish, got translators, and then it got published into English. It's, it's, it, the, the influence of that anthology is enormous, and it's a canonical work. And I was reading this very uh, heavy anthology, more than 100 sh uh, short stories in it, and realized that only about three, four short stories out of 100 um, were written by female authors. So that was an observation that caught my eye immediately. I started doing some research about this, and I compiled more anthologies and realized that there was some pattern there and in this underrepresentation. So I extended my corpus into English, mm -hmm. anthologies in English, in French, in Hispanic, in Spanish, and realized that there was a trend, and the trend was about 10% representation of female authors from the... Uh, 20th and 21st century anthologies. So in the end, I compiled a much larger corpus. I worked with, with statistics, with the help of a scholar who specialized in statistics. And of course, my input was to see at the historical elements that would um, give account of this underrepresentation. Mm -hmm. So again, yes, it started with uh, an observation of a very specific case study, and it extended it into a much larger uh, project. Eva, you want to say? Yeah, um, same for me, really, as for the other two speakers. So there's a, there's a big role played by chance and surprise, I think, in how you come up with your ideas and how you realize that an idea is big enough for a project or for an article. So I think for me, the ideas come, on the one hand, from my own work, so things that surprise me in something that I've done myself but not actually realized that I had done it, and on the other hand, the work of other people. So in terms of my own work, for example, my current research project is based on something that was a pretty small part of my PhD that I didn't think was particularly important at the time, but I was just recording these particular phenomena in my research just for the sake of completeness, and only towards the end, I realized that there's a whole project behind this that I could actually do, which is very exciting. And I didn't, so I had been kind of planting the seeds for this project without actually realizing it myself. And on the other hand, yeah, you often notice, as the other speakers said, things in the work of other people which somehow relate to what you're doing, even though it may not be obvious to begin with. So, for example, I recently got hold of a handout by a colleague in linguistics, but a totally different field in linguistics. I didn't understand most of the handout because it was in generative syntax. But there was one example on the handout used to illustrate, again, something that wasn't really to, to do with my research. But that example on the handout just showed an aspect of, of the singulative, which is my current project, which I hadn't realized existed, really. So, and that sparked a whole idea um, for a cooperation with a friend who is, who's working in that field, which is hopefully going to lead to an article. So that was a very kind of accidental discovery of something that I just happened to see leafing through a handout, not with so much interest because it wasn't directly in my field, and suddenly you get this idea that's hopefully going to lead to a publication. So. Listening to you, oh yeah. Yeah, may I just add, because uh, I just remembered that anecdote um, that happened to me about, on this idea of where do ideas come from, or when do ideas happen? Um, and I remember I, I was teaching an MA module in translation theory, and the assignment, the final assignment for the students was that they had to 
write uh, an essay in which they would develop an original idea using the appropriate theoretical background. And then I got the student knocking on my door, very worried, very anxious, and she asked me, but how do I get an idea? Hmm. And what this student was looking for was the formula following step by step to get this idea that she could develop. And it caught me completely by surprise. Now we're having a great chat and we <laughs> will just give all those tips, but it caught me completely by surprise. And I took my position of the lecturer and said, well, what I would ask you to do would be to go back to your handout and read the bibliography, read the bibliography again, take notes, and then an idea will emerge. I was not happy with that explanation, and I didn't have the formula. But at least it was pointing to some way of perhaps nurturing this capability of creating questions mm -hmm. by reading, which is what we do as scholars, pretty much. Mm. Uh, <coughs> small notice that I think that if anyone or someone uh, says that I have an idea, then in many cases he or she just has not read enough. <laughs> so that, that's not good. <laughs> So um, listening to you, um, in a way, research and curiosity is very, very personal. It's obsession about spaces or, or ancient languages, or it's about your brain images, or it's, it's very personal. But on the other hand, it seems like ideas and curiosity are an interaction. They come from the research subjects, whether they are patients or texts, and they come from colleagues or something. So it's, it's a sort of a collaborative curiosity, in a way. But on the other hand, there's a sort of a much pressure now to be collaborative and be uh, doing interdisciplinary work. What do you feel? Does this somehow, like, is it like, then the curiosity will sort of a merge in this collaboration, or are there sort of a problems also when it comes to this? And how does it, it with different fields? Some of you cooperate with different fields, like Santer you do, but I don't guess, well, you have worked with um, uh, statistics and something like that, but how does it fit in, this curiosity and interdisciplinary work? Yeah, Silva? I guess I'm kind of, I'm in between the two other speakers in that, being in not we can kind of places, yeah, not, <laughs> not neurolinguistics, but general linguistics. We do both. We work on our own, and I've published on my own, but also with people. So we kind of have the luxury of, of you can do both. It's not frowned upon to do one or the other. And I have found that I've really benefited from working with people. Um, I started doing, I wrote my first kind of co-written article last year, and before that I wasn't sure if I would like it, but I'm glad I tried it. So it actually, I found that in that case, because I had a collaborator who um, who I worked very well with, it definitely made the end result better, and we could actually inspire each other um, to new directions. And because if you have a good collaborator, the sum of your two kind of sets of knowledge is often more than um, just the, the two parts. So that's the ideal case for collaboration. And I would say that in my case so far, it hasn't um, been any sort of a hindrance to my mm. curiosity. It's almost the other way around. Um, but I wouldn't want to encourage collaboration just for the sake of collaboration. I think it has to be relevant. It has to be one where all parties have something to, to bring to the end mm -hmm. sum. Well, uh, I would probably start with a couple of negative things about <laughs> collaboration. The first one is, uh, so I, for example, yesterday uh, I had a deadline for sending an abstract for a conference, oh, not, not an abstract, but uh, actually a poster uh, for a conference. And, and because uh, some of my collaborators are in the US, as I mentioned before, then uh, when we have late evening here, then in California, it's still morning. So I had to wait uh, a lot uh, till, till I can get some feedback from one of my collaborators or some approval. Uh, and and uh, so eventually I sent uh, the poster yesterday at 1 a.m. So it's actually today at 1 a.m. And so my, my day started something like 7 a.m. and it has ended at 1 a.m. Uh, because of this kind of collaboration. And other negative thing is that uh, 
sometimes I, ha I have in some publication so many uh, co-authors that uh, when, I, when I have to uh, have a reference to my publication, then even in the uh, references at the end of the publication, there are so many co-authors that some journals require to delete them and only to replace with et al. Uh, if there are, for example, more than six and seven, and I actually do more than, uh, I, I do have more than six, uh, and that's, that's why, so it's impolite way to refer to your collaborators by, by only et al. So me and et al. So that, that's negative things, but, but uh, uh, otherwise it's, it's, only, it's only really positive because, because there are m so many th positive things about that. Uh, Silva has mentioned some of them. And uh, well, you kind of, instead of having two or three reviewers uh, that the journals typically uh, give you, then you have uh, all your collaborators as reviewers, and those are the good reviewers, mm -hmm. so the, the the good cop and the the bad cop. So, and and it, it's it, it's it's nice to have good reviewers, and, and they also contribute with their ideas, and they help you to solve some problems you are not capable to solve, and they bring and they knowledge uh, and, and and many other good things. Mm -hmm. Sure, and also v visibility. Uh, only a technical issue. Uh, your publication will be more visible because you only, only by chance, only like statistically, because you have so many names in, 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 as your co-authors. Mm -hmm. So in any database, if someone is searching according to names, he or she will find your publication because of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very little to add to this point. I would agree with Silva that reviewers will immediately pick up on anyone forcing to present a project in an interdisciplinary way or introduce a collaborator just for the sake of ticking that box. So beware of that. And in general, I would argue that any research is collaborative, even if you don't write together with another author, because you are building on existing knowledge. So you have to be aware of where you're situating yourself in relation to that. And in a sense, you're not isolated, even if you might be writing in your office by yourself. So if collaboration in general is not a hindrance for curiosity and doing research, are there some hindrances? Now, do you, can you identify something that actually is now um, making your research not curious enough or, or not, you're not able to do curiosity-driven research? Yeah, well, if I may, I might say uh, not, not, it's not about not being curious enough, but sometimes not having the uh, time and space to develop that or to see how it develops. Uh, we are very lucky because we are, can spend time at the Collegium, so we're given the time to do that. But more and more so, we're not given the space to do that. And I'm not talking about not having your own office, but I'm talking about, for example, um, I, I've now been struggling to finalize this funding application in which I need to summarize all my ideas in this 100-word abstract. And it's been an absolute nightmare to put all my curiosity points into this 100-word abstract because reviewers won't have the time or they don't get paid enough to pay the attention that our curiosity deserves. And that's one example. The other example is that we are attending a conference tomorrow, tomorrow with other Eurias fellows, and we are asked to summarize our research in two minutes. So more and more so, we don't have the time and space to develop our ideas and show them to other people, which maybe would make them curious too about our points. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with Patricia that time is one of those constraints uh, on curiosity, and for example, if you have to teach, then it is really time demanding uh, activity, and, and uh, it's not that easy to do research and teach at the same time. For example, some uh, titles, like for example, university lecture requires both of those activities, but it, sometimes it's difficult to find a balance. and. Uh, Another issue would probably be publishing because not, for example, it is really difficult to publish uh, negative results. So if your curiosity leads to some research, which in turn leads to uh, negative results, 
it's, it's not easy to publish them. So th th this is another constraint. Yeah, absolutely agree. So time and money are constraints. Um, and I think specifically also in, so not for us in the Collegium, but sometimes funding uh, and jobs can carry kind of goal-oriented, timetable-oriented rules, such as you would have to publish a certain amount of things by a certain amount of time, or in certain number of years, you have to have published this amount of things or, um, or as such. And what this can produce is, like Alexander says, kind of a fear of doing work that might lead to um, negative results or even starting following a lead that actually is then a dead end. So you need a little bit of courage to start following an idea where you're not totally sure that that's actually going to lead somewhere. It does happen that you spend a lot of time reading up on something and, and following an idea and then you just realize it doesn't work or you have to change it considerably into something else. And that takes up time and time is not always on your side in that sense. So it can be that these kinds of goals and, and deadlines and timelines can make you kind of more cautious in how you pick your topics and they might make you less likely to do something that's a little bit brave and that you don't know exactly where it's going. Um, so like Patricia says, I think we're lucky at the Collegium in the sense that we have been given the space um, and the time to, to pretty much pursue whatever we want and we're just trusted that something's going to come out of it in the end. So. That's a good thing. Mm -hmm. So that's the situation now. When you start thinking about the future, are you sort of um, hopeful that you can proceed with this curiosity-driven research, or do you see that is, a, is that sort of curiosity-driven research somehow in danger, uh, or is it still possible to be like this academic person driving towards? whatever you want and what you find to be important? Well, I think it pretty much came across that we think it might be endangered by several things, such as funding schemes um, and the fact that we need food <laughs> to survive. Um, but there are some funding schemes that prioritize curiosity-driven uh, research mm -hmm. and, and even, yeah, the Collegium the fellowships given by the Collegium is an example. In the UK, we have the Leverhulme Trust, which is very much uh, non-impact oriented, and they prioritize creative risk-taking um, research. So there are, there are some spaces of hope, I think. Mm -hmm. Santari, I've heard you say that humanities are really in danger of current funding situation. Right, because uh, for a simple reason that uh, whenever you speak with a lay person, it's way easier to convince him or her that your research is important if you play, as I do, this kind of medical card, I have patients, or I can show you some statistics, uh, I, I play uh, almost every day with R, so I have to calculate all results with R. Or so when when you show some formulas, fancy stuff, then then it's way easier to convince people that your research is not only curiosity driven but also important from the perspective of uh, your society. But but. Uh, in humanities, uh, not all of us can play this card. It's sometimes it's more difficult to convince a uh, lay audience the, 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 that, that your research is as important as uh, some, uh, some research done by physicists or, or uh, in chemistry or wherever. So that's why I think there is constant pressure uh, from the funding sources and even though we can uh, kind of, some funding sources emphasize uh, that, that we are this kind of source that gives you opportunities to uh, broaden boundaries, or, or, or I mean to, 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 to go outside the, the box, but the reality is that f for some uh, foundations, like for example, I don't know, for, for, for example, this Kone Foundation, then they, they only fun, provide funding for five point something, or maybe that, that year it was seven point something applications, which means that 93 
uh, person uh, got nothing. So, and there are not that much opportunities to, to play with. No. Yeah, I agree. So there's quite a lot of pressures from, um, from funding sources. And in terms of when you plan your career in the future, you have to take these things into account if you want to keep getting funding. So I'd say there's kind of there's two things. There are these pressures. There are the certain the kind of the boxes you have to tick or the hats that you have to wear. So interdisciplinary impact, etc. And I think you somehow need to find a way of reconciling that with your your kind of your inner curiosity-driven kind of intuition of where you want to go. So you can't really have just one of those two things if you just go purely for the kind of for the box ticking and things then it's probably not going to look genuine. You do have to have kind of your own idea there, but you have to do it strategically. So it's not enough just to say, I'm really inspired by this thing. I'm really curious about it. You then have to kind of bring in all these, the kind of limitations in a way that you need to take into account if you want to get this idea funded. So it's a constant, I think for me, it's a constant dialogue between two th these two things and the the, um, the challenge is to kind of still keep your eye on the original reason that you're doing this thing and not mm -hmm. forget about it. So even though it's constantly under pressure from um, various kind of very mundane money related considerations. So yeah, it is, it's tricky. Mm -hmm. We have almost an hour of this, this discussion, but um, I don't want to end on constraints and uh, pressures, but like, what is the most exciting thing about your work currently, or what do you want to do? Something like very ending up on positive and uh, uh, interesting. No, what, what are you interested in now? What makes you tick currently, and what do we want to do in the future? What you're curious about right now? Okay. Um, well, I'll, I'll start. Yeah. Okay. I'll start addressing your question first. Um, well, the most exciting thing of my research, I think, is the fact that I'm dealing with texts that even if they're from the 19th century, for me, they're living beings and they, I'm interrog interrogating them, them as if they were alive and they're always replying with different things. So that's, that's the most interesting part. What I wanted to say is that I think we're presenting here a super positive image of curiosity-driven <laughs> research and I feel also that we shouldn't be sc slaves of curiosity. Um, it's a uh, positive word for sure, but I think it's also very important to realize that as researchers, we're going to go through those phases of running out of ideas. And that's where our professional um, side comes in. And in those phases, they're very important phases mm -hmm. to fi finish what you uh, committed to finishing, do some cleansing and make room for new ideas. So it's not that we're constantly being inspired, but we also <laughs> We work very hard to complete what we have said we would. And as I'm saying, those phases of running out of ideas, as frustrating as they can be, I consider them to be an important part of our work to make room for more later on. Well, I would say that if I have to think about my professional life, then the most exciting thing in my professional life is uh, people. So people are, but this time I do mean my colleagues, my co-authors, people I meet in different universities, people I meet at different conferences, uh, also uh, students that take my courses, and th this is the most rewarding, the most exciting uh, thing in my uh, professional life and for example as an anecdote uh, sometimes if your if your course is going well you feel that and, and I told one of, to one of my colleague uh, at the collegium that that sometimes if, if the course if your course is going well and, and, and you feel that students like it then you feel like a rock star and the, the colleague I told the, uh, I told this thing he said no 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 you don't feel like rock star you are a rock star so, so th this is the most rewarding, most exciting thing. Yeah, very much what the other two speakers have said. So, I mean, in terms of my actual topic, I'm very excited about to be working on languages. Um, I love languages and I love both 
languages as a, as a living spoken thing, but also in terms of going into the nitty gritty of structures and of history and how things develop. And I also think, yeah, working with people is a really exciting part of this kind of job. So you travel to really exciting places, you know, to conferences, and you make connections, you bounce off ideas, and you, you're very much like enriched by the encounters that you have with colleagues, but also students, it's a very important one. And the exciting thing about my current work is probably the, the amount of freedom that I have currently in my, in my job to, like I kind of said, just kind of intuitively follow my ideas and to bounce around, not always very methodically, but just kind of I have the space to think and to read and to make space and be open to new ideas. Like Patricia says, you don't have a great new idea every single day, so sometimes you need that week when you're just kind of doing your job, going to the office, um, finishing projects and doing things, and then every once in a while when you have the headspace, um, the new ideas also appear. So, yeah, I don't also don't want to give the impression that you're constantly kind of in a state of, of inspiration and, and new ideas. You sometimes just need to do your job, and then the ideas often come actually when you've gone for a run or to the shower. <laughs> so. Or in the metro. I get yeah. ideas. <laughs> during the 30-minute ride, two or three ideas per metro ride. Okay, thank you very much. We now open the floor for questions in the audience, if there are any intriguing questions there. Like this? Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much, all of you, for your contributions. And what I'm interested is like when you describe your experiences, you were always talking, well, you talk from different ranch aides, like Silva was talking that she got fascinated when she was a kid, and you were talking about more mature stages. So, um, and then also you were talking about this curiosity that at the end is kind of a snowball, because you, you start with some curiosity and then it develops to another curiosity, etc. So talking about when you get these different inquiries in a different life stage, has that changed your way of seeing that curiosity, like being more critical or, you know, because I imagine when you're a kid, you know, and you start being fascinated by Welsh, then you are like very no filter, like passionate, I want to do this, that's all. But then when you're like an adult, then you can get very passionate, but you have always this kind of like mindset or mind walls or something like that. So what is your impression on that? Um, yeah, well, I get that. So yeah, I definitely, as a kind of 17-year-old, I think I didn't have much like realism in my wish to just move to the UK and start studying languages. I just did it, and it was great. Um, as I've got older, yeah, like the realities of, of what it is to be a researcher have obviously come in. So you do need to think not just like, oh, this is a great idea, I'm excited about this, but, you know, is it doable? Is it doable in the time that I have in a particular project? Is it fundable? Does it tick enough of the boxes that will get it funded? Because, yeah, I need to eat. So all of that has come in and a little bit more of like realism. So I've, I've learned to kind of estimate-ish like how long it will take to actually follow an idea to the end. So how long it will take to produce an article or to write a PhD um, and things like that. So I guess, yeah, I've learned to kind of exercise that sort of criticism on my ideas, but I think the initial spark is to some extent the same. So that kind of, I'm just really excited about this thing. I don't know why, it doesn't make any sense in the sense that it's not gonna make me rich or famous, but I just really want to do this. Kind of like Patricia was saying that you almost get a frustration that something hasn't been studied, something hasn't been understood, and I really want to understand it. So I think that remains the same. Does that kind of answer the question? Yeah. <laughs> any other answers? Yeah. Um, your question reminded me of um, this quote by Einstein, which I wanted to raise at some point, and then I forgot. Um, I have no special talent, I'm only passionately curious. And this is quoted again and again, like, I have no special talent, but I am so curious. And this is Einstein saying this, okay. Um, and I hate it because it's curiosity is certainly not enough to produce scholarship. And as you're saying, you can have these ideas and these inspirations, but as maybe you become more experienced in research, 
um, you learn to discard which ideas might lead somewhere, which ones might not for the time being at this, uh, because you need so other things. You need a method, you need a theoretical background, you need to be able to phrase them into questions, you need to be able to, to know where they are situated in the existing body of knowledge, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, yeah, maybe we presented this rather naive idea of uh, curiosity as this engine in our research, and there's certainly much more needed to turn this into scholarship. But sometimes, you see there, is an, there might be an idea behind, there might be a, a paper behind, there might be a project behind, and you don't know what to do with it. It's not the right timing. So I have a freezer, mental freezer, <laughs> where I put these ideas as mental notes and leave them there because you never know when these are going to turn into something else. So up timing is an important issue as well, yeah. Something? No, okay. Any other questions? Over there? I wasn't here from the start, so please ignore my question if, if you, this is something that you already discussed. But I think that we've been circling around this quite a lot also um, in the last question. But how do you, when you, when you get an idea then, uh, and then you start thinking about the, the physical con constraints, the time and the money, but um, content-wise, how do you, you have to judge and be critical if it's a good idea? How do you know that your cu curiosity has led you to something that contributes? Well, I think that you have to read a lot I already mentioned that if you have an idea and you, you think that it's, it's a nice, interesting idea, then uh, it might be that you just, uh, you, you, you didn't uh, uh, read, uh, you didn't read uh, uh, enough. And uh, I also, if, I, if we compare this uh, Finnish PhD system when uh, uh, students, PhD students, have to uh, write the research proposal and uh, research plan already in the beginning of the program of their studies, then it sometimes might be really difficult for them. Be, uh, and we, we can see that if we compare to the US system when, when they actually start the uh, PhD thesis maybe uh, after three, four years being a PhD student and after several exams and after reading a lot of the literature in your field and even narrowing your field to something more specific, then, then, then uh, it, 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 there, there might be some benefits from that. Some, I, I would answer that you have to read, you have to read a lot. Uh, yeah, that was a great question. Um, I would say I'm always slightly scared whether my idea really is, is good and original enough. So you do genuinely kind of have that fear as you <laughs> start working on something. So I would say, like, Alexander, you have to read all the things. You have to ask your colleagues for more references. And you have to read all of those things to make sure that there genuinely is a gap because research at PhD and postdoc level is about originality. So it does have to be original. You have to be addressing some sort of a gap. And then on top of that, you kind of need to work out whether you're really the right person to address that question as well. So do you have the expertise needed to tackle that question? And if you lack just a little bit of it, is there somebody you can cooperate with? So this would be my own way of, of thinking about it. So I might ask somebody to come and co-write who can fill in some of the, um, the gaps if needed. And then once you're pretty sure there's a gap and that you might be the right person to deal with it, like talking to colleagues and talking to your mentors just to... I think that for me is probably the most important step. So I have, you know, like more senior mentors that I trust and I would just say, you know, do you think this is doable? And I would like appreciate what they say on that before pursuing something. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah well, in, in terms of, of contribution, you were saying, um, you identify a potential contribution, but what your contribution is going to be is not up to you to decide. I think it's your peers who, will decide that, or over time, ideally, someone will look back at it and say, yes, actually, this has opened up new venues. 
but I, I and, and, and you're right, I mean, more and more so, we're forced to state our contribution in a project when we are desi uh, designing a project and asking for funding before we even mm -hmm. carrying out the research. But I think this is a total wrong approach to, to research, in which you don't know your contribution. How can you know your contribution before you have even done the research? But yeah. Still more questions? If none, I thank the discussions. <laughs> it has been very interesting, and I hope we get to be very curious about our research, work, life, and everything during this spring and even further. Thank you. Thanks.